Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Jeff Sachs, director of the Earth Institute, and absolutely delighted to welcome Prime Minister Ru Rui Maria Arojo, uh, Prime Minister of Timor-Leste, uh, to this World Leaders Forum gathering at Columbia University. Mr. Prime Minister, you're so uh, welcome here. We're very honored that you're here. Uh, Prime Minister Arojo has been Prime Minister this year, uh, taking office uh, the 16th of February, uh, 2015. He's been a leader of the struggle for independence uh, of Timor-Leste, uh, which was globally recognized uh, in 2002. Timor-Leste counts its independence from Portugal from 1975, but then with the uh, interim uh, war with Indonesia uh, and the long fighting, uh, the global recognition came in 2002. And during that entire period, the Prime Minister has been a leader of building the new country. Uh, he was the first uh, health minister of the country. He has been in key positions uh, all the way uh, through since independence. Uh, he is trained uh, in public health with a master's degree uh, with the absolutely uh, key and suitable topic of uh, a suitable health system for East Timor from the perspective of the East Timorese, which is the right perspective. Uh, and so we're, uh, we know that uh, your expertise has helped to build from scratch the new health system. And I should say that our relationship with Timor-Leste at Columbia University is uh, a very treasured one. We've been working uh, in your country, as you know, Prime Minister, for many, many years on specific uh, issues. Uh, we worked uh, with the preceding government on the strategic development plan and, of course, uh, knew you well in that capacity uh, as uh, you were providing leadership there, uh, as we were discussing with the Prime Minister, with the adoption of the new Sustainable Development Goals as of last Friday, we have the great opportunity to see even faster breakthroughs uh, in sustainable development all over the world, including Timor-Leste, and we're very eager to help you and we'll find very practical ways to do that. So without further ado, we're here to listen to you and eager to hear uh, uh, your vision and an update of the situation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister of Timor-Leste. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to address this World Leaders Forum at Columbia University. And I thank you for inviting me to speak today. I have traveled from the small nation of Timor-Leste to the great city of New York to participate in the United Nations General Assembly. This year, the world celebrates 17th anniversary of the United Nations and its achievements since its establishment after the Second World War. Timor-Leste has much to thank the United Nations for. After the invasion, the United Nations was our key forum advocate for justice and self-determination of our people. It gave our foreign minister in exile, the Nobel laureate José Ramos Horta, the opportunity to lobby the world and shine a light on the suffering of our people. In 1999, the United Nations conducted a referendum in which the Timorese people bravely and overwhelmingly voted for independence. Following the vote, the United Nations administered our country until 2002, as we prepared to take control of our own destiny. Our nation started with nothing. After almost 500 years, 
as a Portuguese colony, followed by 24 years of occupation, we were left with no infrastructure, no institutions of government, no health or education system, and most importantly, with no money. Today, however, Timor-Leste is often presented as a successful model of peace building and state building. After a difficult start, we now enjoy peace, a free and democratic society, and an open economy with strong growth. We are also fortunate that one of the best decisions we made was to direct every dollar earned from our petroleum resources into a sovereign wealth fund which now holds over $16 billion. We achieved our progress with the help of the United Nations family, and it wasn't until 2012 that the last UN mission left our country. With our deep engagement with the United Nations, we know better than most that it is not a perfect institution and that it is in need of reform. We also understand, however, that the United Nations play an important role upholding the global multilateral system and protecting small and fragile states. It is in this context that I today will speak briefly about global challenges and small nations. It is our experience that while the great powers of the world shape the current of international affairs, it is often small nations that are the most affected. From the ravages of climate change to entrenched poverty and debilitating conflict, the consequences of the actions of great countries can overwhelm the fragile and small nations. We see this clearly in the Pacific, where Timor-Leste has many friends and is privileged to be an observer nation in the Pacific Island Forum. Sadly, some of our island nation friends face an existential threat as rising sea levels see the waves of the vast ocean of the Pacific wash over their territory. Climate change is a global challenge that has a disproportionate impact on many small and vulnerable nations that have themselves contributed little to the problem. As the whole peoples of some island nations are threatened, the craving self-interest of greater nations is laid bare. That is why the challenge of climate change demands a global solution. Later this year, the world will meet in Paris at the, at the United Nations Climate Change Conference to forge an international response. We look to this conference with expectation and hope for our shared future. There are, of course, other global challenges that impact upon small and developing countries. One of our greatest international challenges is addressing fragility and conflict. The fragility of countries is condemning people to entrench poverty, fear, and hopelessness. We know well that there can be no development without peace, and yet over a billion people in our world live in fragile and conflict-affected countries. We see the corrosive impact of conflict bringing out the poorer demons of the human spirit leading to unspeakable acts of terror against the innocent and the vulnerable. Regrettably, it was a defining shortcoming of the Millennium Development Goals that not one fragile or conflict-affected countries achieved even one Millennium Development Goal. In Timor-Leste, we know well from our lived experience the, the destructive effect of conflict on human development I was, 11, I, beg your pardon. I was 11 years old when Indonesia invaded our country in December 1975. My adopted father was soon arrested and imprisoned without trial. 
The rest of our family escaped to the resistance control areas of our country, but we lived in desperate fear and hunger and on the run in the mountains. This was the experience of our people. We found ourselves overwhelmed by the global currents of the Cold War and the fear that communism would spread through Southeast Asia. As a result, Western powers supported and supplied an Indonesian di dictatorship that was oppressing its own people as well as the Timorese. Over the 24 years of our occupation, we lost almost a third of our population. Following our independence, we remained very fragile. We suffered the cars of many post-conflict countries with continued internal unrest. It was not until after our internal conflict in 2006, which saw street fighting and death again in our capital, Dili, that our people said, enough. Together, we recognize that without stability and peace, we could not build a state and truly free our people. Timor-Leste is now fortunate to be living in peace. Regrettably, too many other nations in the world continue to suffer from fragility and conflict. Most of us can only weep at the implosion of Syria and the human tragedy and waves of refugees that have followed. And while Timor-Leste was happy to lose its claim to being the youngest nation in the world following the birth of South Sudan in 2011, we soon despaired as conflict tore this young country apart. We also see conflict across other parts of Africa, including fighting in Mali and the Central African Republic and the disintegration of Libya. Many countries across Asia and Latin America also remain very fragile and struggle to make human development and make any progress. Many of these countries are too small and too weak and too poor to withstand internal conflict and global pressures. While the developed world may feel proud of its stability, we should all recognize that it is, in fact, a rare and very precious thing. Even stronger nations struggle to maintain stability and continuity. For example, less than 10 nations that existed in the 1900 have since avoided violent overthrow of their governments. It is in this reality that many small and fragile nations need the assistance of the international community to realize peace and build resilient state institutions. Regrettably, however, even when these countries do achieve peace, they face a new challenge, the challenge of development in an unequal world. Timor-Leste is still coming to terms with this reality. Despite our progress, too many of, of our people still face extreme poverty with limited access to quality education and health care. Across the world, too many people also suffer hunger, preventable diseases and entrenched poverty. Globalization has made a huge difference and has helped lift millions of people out of poverty. However, many nations and people that have little to offer the global economy are being left behind. Even in our region, with the shift of economic weight to a rise in Asia, many nations are struggling to grasp the opportunities presented by this profound global adjustment, and they remain poor and vulnerable. They find themselves on the bottom in an uneven and unequal world. And so, inequality is now widely recognized as a pressing global challenge. As His Holiness Pope Francis recently said, and I quote, today everything comes under the laws of competition and the survival of the fittest, where the powerful feed upon the powerless. As a consequence, masses of people find themselves excluded and marginalized, without work, without possibilities, without means of escape, end of quote. With inequality, both within and between nations, millions are trying to escape the grip of extreme poverty. 
This challenge is made more difficult by the faltering global economic recovery. And in small nations such as Timor-Leste that are reliant on the export of our commodities, falling prices are putting additional financial pressure on governments trying to support development. Small and developing countries cannot address the challenge of inequality and poverty alone. The global economy can be brutal and unforgiving to struggling nations. It is therefore necessary for the world to work together to find pathways so that developing, developing nations can participate in a productive way in the international economy. We must encourage good governance and transparency in public financial management systems and fight the scourge of corruption. And we must work towards a new global economic vision that respects the dignity of people and supports the development of nations. Ladies and gentlemen, I did not come here today just to dwell on the global challenges that buffet the development of small states such as my country. Today, I wanted to emphasize the need for a globally united response to these challenges and to confirm our confidence in the possibilities of the international order. Last week, we saw the full promise of international cooperation and goodwill when the world's leaders came together at the United Nations and committed to 17 goals for sustainable development. Through the commitment to these goals, the achievement of three exceptional things are within reach, ending extreme poverty, fighting inequality, and fixing climate change. If the world is successful, we will be the first generation to end extreme poverty. The global goals for sustainable development are ambitious, but it is imperative that we succeed. The global goals are for all countries and for all people, and they are most important for developing and small nations like the one I come from. Timor-Leste was deeply involved in the development of the global goals. Through Timor-Leste's leadership of the G7 Plus group of 20 fragile and conflict-affected states, we advocated for the importance of addressing fragility and building peace before inequality could properly be tackled and nations developed. That is why we are so pleased that Global Goal 16 is peace and justice and strong institutions. Global Goal 16 seeks to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. The inclusion of Global Goal 16 is a clear recognition that conflict and weak institutions are barriers to development. The international, commun I beg your pardon. The international commitment to the Global Goals give gives us faith in the promise of cooperation between nations of the world. It is important that small nations realize that they also have a responsibility to contribute to, go to global cooperation and action. We cannot leave it to the great powers to solve our global challenges. In Timor-Leste, we recognize that after being supported by the international community for so long, it is now our time to give back. That is why we have been leading the G7 Plus group of fragile nations to share our experiences and provide support to peace building and state building. Timor-Leste has helped fund the latest elections in Guinea-Bissau to restore democracy to this fellow nation beset by coup d'etats. And we provided financial support in the fight against Ebola in Africa and also in other regions. Altogether, between 2008 and 2013, Timor-Leste has provided in official development assistance, ODA, to small, fragile, and countries facing emergencies, an average of 0.27% of Timor-Leste's non-oil GNI. This is, ladies and gentlemen, higher than the ODA rates, rates 
of USA and Japan, and is almost similar to ODA rates from Australia for the year 2014. Timor-Leste currently holds the presidency of the community of Portuguese language countries, and through this body, we are looking to address the shared development challenges of the smaller member states of this organization. Timor-Leste is also a strong supporter of the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, which provides a global standard to promote open and accountable management of natural resources. Additionally, Timor-Leste is proud to provide an outstanding example of reconciliation through its peace and friendship with Indonesia. We now enjoy deep bonds of solidarity with our Indonesian brothers and sisters, and our relationship provides a global model for partnerships between Muslim and non-Muslim nations. Perhaps most significantly, however, is our recent experience on inclusive democracy, where the nation has gone through a less divisive and non-confrontational democratic path in the national politics during the last three years, whereby the winning parties work hand in hand with the opposition to strengthen peace and fortify institutions to achieve commonly agreed development goals through consensual legislative and budget approvals without sacrificing the multiplicity of individual thoughts and options. This experience shed some light on new democratic ways of doing politics, which are less divisive, non-confrontational, and more conducive to peace building and state building, which are very important in very fragile states. Ladies and gentlemen, it is within this context that we believe that the multilateral system and international law is so important for the protection of small countries. The experience of Timor-Leste also shows the great value of the United Nations and the importance of dialogue, diplomacy, and international law to resolve any conflict. While Timor-Leste restored independence in 2002, there is, however, one final step we need to take to achieve our full sovereignty. That step is the permanent delimitation of our maritime boundaries with Indonesia and Australia. Our good friend from Indonesia has agreed to commence negotiations to finalize our maritime boundaries. Australia, however, has so far refused to negotiate a maritime boundary with Timor-Leste in the Timor Sea, a 435-mile-wide oil-rich stretch of water between Timor and northern coast of Australia. We are hopeful that the new Prime Minister of Australia will revisit his government's position and sit down and talk with us like neighbours and friends. Like Timor-Leste, Australia has ratified the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which imposes an obligation on states to reach final agreements on maritime boundaries. Within this framework, we are asking Australia to meet with us and agree on our maritime boundaries set in accordance with international law. We recognize that the future of our people and our nation's sovereignty continues to depend on the international system and the respect for international law. Like other small and developing nations, we look to the international community and the multilateral system of global governance to deliver justice and human development. Ladies and gentlemen, while the small and developing nations of the world are vulnerable to the global challenges of climate change, conflict and inequality, we also have confidence in the promise of international cooperation. Small states cannot address global challenges alone. Our, inter beg your pardon, our interconnected world demands global solutions. That is why Timor-Leste is such a strong supporter of the United Nations and the solidarity of the international community. It is only through working together that, that we can achieve global peace and justice, sustainable development, and uphold respect for human dignity. I thank you very much for listening to me and uh, will be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you for sharing so eloquently these uh, unique and valuable insights uh, of not only the challenges, but also the opportunities uh, uh, for a small and young country, one that's emerged from conflict, but is also now very clearly playing a leadership role at the regional level and also uh, internationally. I think all of us here have great admiration uh, for the progress that you've made against all odds, really, over the past 13 years since uh, your, your uh, full independence. So, uh, with the permission of the Prime Minister, I'd now like to uh, open up uh, for questions. I know it's always uh, difficult to get the first person up to the microphone, but I'm sure I have a volunteer there. Yes, please go ahead. Good morning, sir. Thank you for coming here. Kindly this. identify your, your name sure. and your school institution. I'm Thank Samia Ashok. I'm from the Graduate School of Journalism here at Columbia University. I'm actually, I should confess that I'm working on a paper, so I want a quick quote from the Prime Minister here. I'm very, very interested in knowing about the high fertility rates that Timor-Leste is dealing with at the moment. Over the last 11 years, there has been a drop, so from uh, 7.8 uh, births per woman, it's come it's come down to about 5.3. In the context of 96% of your population being Catholic, in that context, how are you dealing with um, such a high birth rate? Do you find this a challenge? Do you think that the government is looking at it as a worrying factor, or do you think um, you know, this is good for a growing nation? Could you please comment on that? Thanks. Okay. Would you Sorry. like to take a few questions first? Yes. yes. OK. Please. Good morning, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, my name is Alexander Furtig, and I'm a student at the School of International and Public Affairs here at Columbia. Um, so I, I worked in Timor-Leste this summer, actually. I was working in the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, so my question is about food security. Um, through, through my work in the ministry, I learned that um, one of the most pressing challenges for food security in Timor-Leste is the fact that many people in Timor-Leste are moving out of agriculture. Um, and uh, production levels in many of the major food crops are decreasing dramatically. So my question is, how can Timor-Leste reverse this trend? Um, and what role does agriculture play in the broader economic vision for the future? And finally, as a small nation, do you believe that food self-sufficiency is an important goal for the future of Timor-Leste? Thank you. Please. Dr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, my name is Sean Ryan. Um, I'm an undergraduate student uh, in Columbia College. Um, I'm very interested in your, in your background as a, as a uh, physician, actually. Um, and I just wanted to get a sense of uh, how your work as a physician has influenced your view of climate change uh, in Timor-Leste. Uh, and perhaps the, uh, the world at large. Thank you. Well, can we, we'll take one more and, and then we'll get some responses, please. Last one. Hi, my name is Nora Keller. I'm at the um, political science department getting my PhD and I'm actually writing about um, the Timorese resistance as part of my dissertation. So my question is, one of the really striking things about the resistance campaign is the high degree of popular participation through protests and demonstrations, both in East Timor and in Indonesia. Um, first, what, to what do you attribute this high degree of willingness in the population to put themselves at direct risk through participating? And second, um, to what extent do you think that this degree of popular involvement affected post-conflict post politics and stability? Shall I? Shall I answer first, first yeah. some of those? Um, I'm sorry, I could not retain exactly the names. So I'll, I'll, I'll go for the, the, the first question on uh, fertility rates. Uh, it's, it's, it's not easy because of a Catholic country. It's not easy to come with uh, uh, population policies and, and talk to people uh, about uh, family planning, particularly uh, leading with contraceptives and so on and so on. Uh, but one thing is for sure, uh, the, 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 uh, the Timorese uh, 
people had always been uh, traditionally uh, with big sized families. And one of the things that uh, still is in the mentality of the people is that the more uh, sons and daughters you have, the better, particularly in the rural areas. So uh, the only way to get around this is education and uh, get uh, more younger people involved in the modern economy. Uh, you can notice the difference. Uh, after this, this um, demographic health survey done in 2009, which uh, uh, showed a reduction in total fertility rates, uh, you can clearly see the difference of, uh, in, the, in the size of family members and in the uh, total number of children in the family from people living in the rural areas with uh, uh, lower level of education as compared to people living in the urban areas and better educated. Now, in some urban families, uh, both men and women are now working and it's, it's uh, uh, without any, any, any uh, uh, kind of uh, campaign, the, the, the pair themselves decided to have up to one or two children only. So, for a small country like Timor-Leste, if you talk about the projection of population growth, it is a very important economic issue for us to deal with. But having also in mind the uh, characteristic uh, Catholic kind of tradition in our country, the, the, the policy that the government is uh, choosing is to uh, give emphasis on the education, uh, disseminating information about the implications of a uh, bigger number of uh, children in the family, uh, including the implications to the health of mothers, in, uh, implications to access of health care and others, and let the people decide. And then uh, at the public health facilities, it is a duty of the government to also provide the, the, the uh, to also make available the options for couples to choose. Of course, uh, uh, if 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 they are faced with a, a, a choice of using contraceptive or not, they will listen to 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 the religious leaders. But health professionals have also uh, the obligation to explain to them the 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 benefits of uh, having or not uh, going through a family planning program. So that's, that's more or less the way we are tackling with the issue now. The second question from Alexander. Uh, I hope you know some tattoo now. How, lo how long have you lived there? Three months. Three months, okay, good. Naran Alexandre, oh dear, obrigado. Uh, I think I go, I go, I, I, I'll answer the, the, the last point first. Uh, small countries, is it important to be self-sufficient in food or not? I think we have to be realistic. The fertile land available in the country is not sufficient for us to be food sufficient. If you talk, for example, about rice or maize. So currently, we are trying to bring back uh, the people to agriculture. Under this new government, uh, we've started a policy uh, of linking, linking uh, agricultural production with uh, the intervention in the market that uh, the Ministry of Commerce and Industry is doing on behalf of uh, uh, food security. As you may have noticed when you were there, uh, during, during uh, bad harvest seasons, uh, food availability is, is a problem. Uh, 
in the country. And from previous governments, there was a policy decision to uh, have rice stocks in the government warehouses in order to do market intervention to facilitate the poor to get access to food. Now, what we are doing now is combining these two things. We are talking to the, the Ministry of Agriculture, is talking to farmers, saying the government uh, would be interested in buying your products uh, in the next harvest season. If you are interested, you sign up, you sign a contract with the government, you start producing. Because one of the problems for, for agriculture production in Timor-Leste, particularly uh, things like uh, rice and maize, is related to the perception that there is no market for people to sell their products. Now, with this uh, government budget to buy national products, we're introducing a new mechanism in order to uh, give incentives to the farmers to produce on the basis of some uh, contracts so that they, 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 they are sure that there will be buyers out there when they produce. This is one of the first steps. Now, the second big policy issue that we are now focusing on is to introduce variety in the agriculture field. Cash crops is one of the, uh, is one of the solutions for our farmers. Uh, you know that one of our uh, kind of uh, important uh, market products is our coffee. Our coffee is, uh, is on the Starbucks, and they've told me a few weeks ago that if you walk into Starbucks and ask for Timo coffee, they'll give you Timo coffee, but the price was, uh, will be higher compared to other coffee. Uh, so the niche market for organic coffee of Timor-Leste is there. Now, we are trying to, to, to incentivate the community to uh, uh, be more involved in that area, particularly in the uh, mountain regions in the central part of Timor-Leste. So uh, coffee is one, cash crop. Cashew nuts is the other. And, uh, uh, there are a lot of initiatives now at the Ministry of Agriculture to, to move uh, people towards focusing on agriculture. Now, the other issue related to one of your, your, your questions about how important is agriculture in the economy, uh, we, we think that agriculture is very important. Uh, since, since the establishment of, the, of this new government, we came up with uh, three packages of reforms, one at the administration level, the other is a fiscal reform, and the third one is the economic reform. Now, the economic reform area is focusing on main, mainly, focusing mainly on two areas, agriculture and tourism. Uh, the, so during the next coming years, the diversification of our, of our economy, economy will be focused on these two big areas. Uh, Sean, ask about my experience as a physician, as a physician on the climate change. Uh, the, last, uh, the last time I was practicing as a physician was January this year. Uh, the, 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 to answer your question, in my clinic, I see on average 20 to 25 patients a day. I'm, I'm a GP, a general practitioner. And uh, five years ago, five years ago, there were a lot of uh, the, the, the cases related to infectious and contagious diseases were very high. Things like malaria, tuberculosis, you almost see every day. But now, the rate of infectious and contagious disease are going down. Uh, the, the number of cases like uh, hypertension, high cholesterol, uh, uh, what else? Diabetes is coming up. Now, to answer your question, does that have any relationship with the climate change? Uh, I think so, because 
the, the mosquito breeding sites, mosquito breeding sites in the country, the last survey done by WHO has shown that mosquito breeding sites have been reduced because of the warming up of the, of, of, of the climate in Timor-Leste. Now, uh, that might not be the answer to the question, but uh, in terms of pattern of diseases, in terms of pattern of diseases, we can see a lot of changes now in Timor-Leste. Uh, the the one, one that is uh, uh, mostly relevant to your question is the upper respiratory tract infection is the most uh, uh, highly prevalent case in the public, uh, particularly in the community health centers. So why is that? If you ask the question, uh, it might have to do with the changes in the season that we have now in Timor. Usually, in the past, uh, the rainy season would be for six, six to seven months in a year. Now it's been reduced to four, and the 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 the, uh, the temperature, even even in the mountainous areas, if you go now, you feel like uh, quite hot up in the hills. So uh, the effects of climate change is is uh, also. Uh, being seen in the health sector in Timor-Leste. I think I cover all the questions. Popular involvement. Ah, sorry. There is, there is one question about popular involvement. To answer, to answer your question, I think uh, in the past, popular involvement was so high. Currently, when it comes to participation in development, the participation is not so high. Why is that? Uh, our founding fathers have been also reflecting on this issue. And one, one of the answers that they put forward was that in the past, Everybody saw independence, political independence, as a common cause. Everybody uh, wanted to contribute to that cause and participated a lot. After independence, uh, the, the, the common cause for the country is not uh, very uh, clear to people. Um, each one would think about their own lives and the, the, the drive to support the development of the country is not yet uh, very clear in the eyes of the population. So what the Founding Fathers have decided to do and uh, we are trying to support the idea is to come up with a new cause for the country. And the new cause for the country has been spelled out since one or two years ago is the eradication of poverty. Now, uh, campaigns have been uh, uh, done at the community level to convince people that our new fight now is to, is to get rid of the poverty in our country, and that needs the participation of everybody. The results are not yet uh, seen, uh, but we believe that uh, when, we put our, when we put our efforts together to move that process ahead, to make sure that people understand that that is the common cause, I think we'll be able to mobilize many more people uh, to support the cause of development. Okay, so we're, we're really down to the last two questions. You've been waiting patiently. Please. Uh, hi, I'm Arja Dayal, and I'm also studying in SIPA doing the development practice program. Uh, this summer, I was also in Timor Less working with basic program with the Ministry of Health. Uh, my questions, I actually have two questions, but I'm going to make it short. Uh, uh, one of them is water resource management. Uh, 
Water resources in Timor-Leste are considered highly sacred and pertaining to sacred families. Um, in light of this, how do you think Timor-Leste can strengthen water resource management at a local uh, level and also accessibility to all? My second question is, there's high uh, stunting, uh, which is related to sanitation and hygiene. According to you, what should be the key priorities of Timor-Leste going ahead? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a real honor to be able to ask this question. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Joshua Drim, a lecturer in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology. You've talked about this, uh, this unifying goal of having a campaign against poverty, and I'm wondering, within that concept, how or, or is there a place for a discussion about biodiversity conservation? And do you see those as being um, a secondary goal or as part and parcel of the, the conflict on poverty? Thank you very much. Um, water resource management. Uh, this is a big problem in the country. Uh, I'm not so sure whether you were there during the rainy season. You would see that uh, the rivers of Timor-Leste are, are full of, uh, full of uh, water, but also full of uh, eroded land. Uh, We haven't done much on that up until now. There were some, some studies done by the Ministry of Agriculture and also by, in the past by the Ministry of Development in order to see how we could introduce uh, water, water catchment, what, water catchment systems uh, starting from the rural areas. Uh, but up, up until now, nothing has been done. Uh, we see that as uh, one of the important ways of uh, improving the water resource management in our country. Uh, the, the, the issues related to accessibility, uh, the latest statistics talk about 60-something uh, rural families, 60% uh, rural families having access to clean water, but not constantly, not daily, uh, not uh, running water. Uh, and in the rural areas, uh, in the, sorry, in the, uh, in the urban areas, the, the running water system is not functioning very well. Uh, I think one, one or two months ago, I uh, had the chance to, to, to have visits to the water catchment uh, points in, in the city of Dili, and then uh, try to understand what were the problems. Uh, the, the volume of water that was uh, uh, being catched and pulled in the tanks, uh, according to the explanation of the technical people, is enough, but the network of distribution is not working. At the moment, uh, we are doing a study uh, between the Ministry of Public Works and uh, Asia Development Bank in order to see the possibility of uh, having the private sector managing the water catchment and distribution, uh, storage and distribution systems. But that's going to be in the urban areas, uh, in, in, in Delhi particularly. In the rural areas, uh, the support that development partners have been doing to us uh, during the last decade was focusing on independent uh, water fountains so that people can get access and manage by the community. But uh, in our view, this is a kind of uh, temporary measure. Uh, we've uh, talked at the technical level to come up with a strategic development plan for water management systems and uh, the water and sanitation people are now working on that to see uh, how could we solve this complex issue of uh, uh, water accessibility to our, particularly to our uh, rural communities. Now, on the issue of uh, stunting, sanitation and hygiene, uh, the, the relationship is very important. I, I think one, one of the problems related to stunting is also uh, the, the deworming program 
uh, that uh, unfortunately didn't, didn't uh, 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 took off effectively in the country. As, as you know, the, the, uh, the prevalence of uh, warming in the country is very high. And if we talk about uh, school age kids, uh, deworming and water and sanitation and hygiene will, be, uh, will have a huge influence in the nutrition of the kids. So water accessibility will play an important role. And then uh, education to families, particularly in, in the area of uh, hygiene and sanitation, uh, will make a difference. Things are now changing, uh, but still with a very slow pace. In areas where, where families have access to water, uh, the, the, uh, the prevalence of stunting is uh, being monitored as going down. Uh, and, and also uh, uh, in areas where not only wa water is accessible, but also food availability is high. This is going down. On the issue of biodiversity, I have to acknowledge I'm not an expert in this area, uh, but what we try what we try to do is to keep as much as possible the biodiversity of the country, not to be disturbed by the new developments. Let me give you one concrete example. We have uh, protected areas. Uh, in the eastern part, for example, uh, it's uh, called Parque Nino Coni Santana, uh, which is one of the highest uh, uh, bi bio biodiversity presence in the region. The, the Ministry of Tourism um, has prepared some plan to, to, to boost uh, tourism in that area, uh, but the Ministry of Agriculture is now working together with tourism in order to maintain the, the, the environment and the, the conditions to uh, maintain biodiversity in that area. So uh, we need development, but uh, at this stage, we think that our development should not harm the biodiversity of the country. And that's what we're doing uh, through agriculture and tourism at the moment. Okay, I think that's really all we have time for this morning. Um, so, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I just wanted to say how grateful we are that, that you took time out to come to Colombia. Um, not only to share the experience of Timor-Leste, but also to, to look at the world as a whole and, and to share your aspirations. And I, I really do appreciate how generous you were in responding in, in, in tremendous detail and, and with deep knowledge to all of the questions that were uh, asked this morning. I, you may be surprised at the number of our students here at Columbia who have some experience in Timor-Leste. And I think many more are actually interested in, in, in gaining that uh, experience. And we've had at least uh, seven interns there last uh, summer. And we're really grateful for the hospitality and the opportunities that they bring. But what I'd like to see going forward is that we have more Timorese students coming here to Colombia. Um, and I really hope that somehow we can, we can make that uh, uh, jointly possible. So um, all of us here congratulate you. We congratulate your government. We congratulate the people of Timor-Leste on, on the progress uh, that you're all making under you know, quite challenging circumstances. We wish you the best going forward. And I think you can rest assured that, that Colombia uh, is, is totally with you in this endeavor. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me in thanking uh, the Prime Minister. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, for those who, who will have the opportunity to come to Timor again, please let us know. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats as we escort the President from the Prime Minister from the building. Thank you.